I have guests today. I have four or four women visiting me today. My power is drawn from the fact that I can see them and they can see me. I see you. And I see you over here. And we thank you for giving us the opportunity to have this conversation with you. It's a great day to have this conversation because it's election day in New Zealand. And I'm hearing a throaty, throaty comments. And women do vote here, but they didn't always vote. It took a while. And New Zealand is touted as that country that self-governing nation that passed that act that allowed women to vote. But wait a minute, did every woman vote at that time? No, the vote came with conditionalities. Once upon a time, the vote was linked to property owning conditions and then to taxes. And it was European and it was Maori men then we were coming and coming. It was a struggle. Today we sit here and we acknowledge that struggle because women are not voting just because someone find, found it lovely for them to vote. Women are voting because women fought to vote. And I don't want us to take that lightly. And that's the kind of conversation we want to have today, not about voting, but the struggles that have taken us up to places of leadership. And when I say leadership, don't be thinking of the, the political ones at home, the various places in which we hold leadership positions. My panelists today are going to delve into those places. I want you to pay attention because um, some of those roles are so powerful, but the narrative doesn't capture that. And I want you to pay attention to the kind of data that will be shared with us. It may not always look like quantitative data, but it's data nonetheless, because we're going to hear examples of women rising. And we're also going to hear the hurdles they had to overcome. And we're going to hear about what keeps us where we are. And so I invite you to be part of this conversation. Because there's something wrong with countries and nations that have populations in which women are more than men and women are not in all levels of power. There is something <coughs> sick about that. And we've got to name it. Yesterday we talked about some of the gender issues. Today we really want to surface women's issues. And it will go, we will mention other dimensions of gender, but I know you and others dealt with this yesterday. Gender equity remains a problem, and women's issues we can't take for granted. My panelists, who are very, I will be introducing shortly, but as Eddie said, read what is in the book, because what I have to tell you is what you don't know. So please read what is in the book. I want to start with Dana. I don't know what page that is in, but please find that. What you know is that Donna is an, an attorney and mediator and ombuds practitioner. And she, until recently, was the political ombudsman of Jamaica. And she does amazing work across the Caribbean as mediator, trainer, justice, and development practitioner. But this is what is not being told. And today I'll refer to narratives a lot. The part of the data we don't hear is that from the women. That the Donna that I've known for 20 years is that kind of Donna who allowed people to climb up. And she seeks people out, young people, and she coaches them, mentors them, 
and she listens to them. This is my experience 20 years ago. Maxine can attest to this. This is a woman who makes sure that when she gets through the door, someone else comes through the door. And that someone else could be in a dungeon or a hole and she'll pull that person up. Please welcome Mrs. Donna Parchment Brown. You may have seen and not heard much from the powerhouse that is called Una. Sorry. And what you will find in the in the book, and, and I don't want the pages, so you know, take just really take Eddie's advice here. Um, in the book, we talk about the Una who works at the Pacific Center for Peace Building. I know this organization is located in Fiji. And this woman called Una is passionate about getting grassroots folks to come together to solve problems. And her work amazes me because she's able to touch different levels of society. And a group that is so critical to her work are what we call the traditional leaders. Sometimes when we list the actors in democracy, we forget that. In traditions like Fiji has, and Itoke in particular, the chiefs play such a critical role, and civil society must engage these groups. And she does that. But you'll find that in the book. Let me tell you what you don't know. <laughs> Una and I, once upon a time, created, and she doesn't even know this thing because it was in my head, and I didn't have the courage to tell her. We, created what I called in my head, women on the porch. And she would call me up and say, hey Ruby, you know this issue, oh, should we discuss it a bit? I said, come over, we sit on my porch, make a cup of tea. Two and a half hours, three hours, Una leading heavy conversation into the situation of women in Fiji, in ways that I have not seen written up in a book. We have a photo which I, I should have sent to Eddie you know, to show because we have a photo, I think it's somewhere on Facebook. And we were sitting there, there's two women in our bula cloth, because I was wearing my Ghana bula cloth, and we sat there and dissected, and this generated proposals that went far and wide in our own work. It's not written up. Welcome, Una. <laughs> You have probably read in the book already about Jenny Zapata. And it will tell you that she's a communicator and environmentalist. And that she's worked with the WWF and she's passionate about everything nature. That she keeps governments on their toes. But what we haven't described here as a woman is I had the opportunity, Maxine and Leo will remember, 2015, when we were tasked to find the alumni, the former fellows of the Karen Foundation. And we searched, Bettina is listening, thank you Bettina, and looked for emails and reconnected with Jenny. And when we reconnected with Jenny and we did interviews on Skype then, and she told us about our work, I came away thinking, boy, this is what we've been saying. Not everyone comes to the foundation and goes away to go and hold a forum. We're talking about people who are using democratic principles at every level of their work. And we wrote that report, and although we didn't mention your name, we didn't have your permission, we said there is another aspect of this work developing around the world. People using these principles, and so when we assess the work of the Kettering Foundation, we should look beyond who is holding a forum to who is solving problems democratically. And then last year, I reconnected with Jenny. And again, I saw this powerhouse in another panel in Argentina. And breaking down these challenges to democracy, information sharing, misinformation, technology, and so on. And I thought, we have not captured the full story. Welcome, Jenny. <laughs> Mm. 
the Nigerians will say, Chineke God will help me. <laughs> Enter E.T. I want to acknowledge Miss Phoebe here, who had been to the foundation, wrote an amazing paper about a woman, Mary, and that woman's apron. And that apron signified the ways in which that woman was helping the community day after day. She remembered that woman as somebody wearing an apron. You know, maybe you all have that image you all the time because there was something to do. That woman was her mother. And that ignited something in us. 2019, in Dayton, Ohio. Very striking and emotional piece of paper that the work that followed after that continues to this day in this room. So Phoebe then came back, talked to people, built her network, started sharing with us the network in many ways, but she said something. She said, the spaces that we have are not always conducive for First Nations and Indigenous folks to talk. What can we do about that? And I said, the work that you've done needs to go far and wide, so what can we do about that? Long story short, Phoebe, then connected with me, Paloma, Maxine, Maxine said, go ahead and experiment something. That's what we do. And a space opened. It was called a First Nations conversation. It was a small space. It wasn't open to the whole world because we were not sure what that was going to be. And in that space, the first time I entered, with trepidation actually, such, it was just such a holy space. It was, there was something about that Zoom call. And on that Zoom call was eating. Sitting there, sharing with women from across the globe issues that we didn't know resonated among us. And as she spoke, we could see that this was a woman who has children who has mokopunas. I hear there's one on the way, you're going to have a grand soon. Congratulations. And everything she said was about a just society. We've got to have a just society. And she does not want her children and children's <coughs> children to come and meet the New Zealand she did not like. So what a powerhouse in this meeting. And I thought, I thought well, how does she have time to do all of this because she was working with the Maori principles, which I hope you can talk about at some point, and these emerging leaders. And she was so humble about the work, saying she, she's privileged to be doing this work. We were blessed to have her in the meeting. And when I left the first meeting, again, I thought about the Kerry Foundation assessing it, but it is never been to date. But this, it is an example of what you have said, Maxine, several times. This thing needs to spread. It can't just be the 400. And it is an example of someone who joined, didn't need to have been in our circles, but pushed this conversation. And now, <laughs> Phoebe and E.T. have this space in which they are putting out amazing policy briefs, which I hear is shaking some quarters of the community. And sometimes people are calling you and saying, when is the brief coming? <laughs> That's what has happened. And we were not part of it, Maxine. That just sparked up. Welcome, E.T., into my parlor. <laughs> I think introductions have to be meaningful. We've got to know who we're talking to. So welcome. Hola. What is on my mind? Now I want to start with you here. Now go to our, our, our audience. But it's really one family here. What is on my mind? And I'm going to start with you, Donna. Why aren't women in the places they're supposed to be? And why have we not told the stories of those who have been there? Now I know you have many examples of those who have risen. Thank you so much, Ruby, as for making us feel so welcome in your home and among your friends and family here this morning. I made some notes because I knew you were a woman of challenges. So <laughs> as, as I come into this conversation and reflect on the question you've asked, I want to acknowledge that in the last century and a quarter, we have made more progress as women than in the previous 19 centuries. So I think we can give our world a round of applause as a warning. You know, I, I, there are a few thoughts I, I want to share that 
a surrounder, Helen Reddy wrote a song that became very popular. I am a woman, hear me roar. If I have to, I can do anything. I am strong. I am invincible. I am woman. And everybody knows Aretha made into a classic, a song that has been around a long time. What did she say? We all need R-E-S-P-E-C-T. That's what we need as women. Because if we're not respected, then we can't be treated as equal. We can't ascend and occupy the spaces to which we can add value. And uh, you started off this morning hearing some songs from Shaggy. Don't you underestimate the strength of a woman. Whether we're quiet or whether we're loud, whether we're vulnerable or we're out there seeming invincible, we're strong. Strong in the way that elastic is strong, that bamboo is strong, that mahogany is strong. We're strong in what is required at the time. And so when we think about the spaces that women are occupying and how we have gotten there, we, we're on this platform because we have gotten to a point where, where we think, somebody thinks that we have something to offer to such a conversation. And as, as I was thinking about this, I, I remembered some women. Lillian Mayers, the richest woman in the world. She's the L'Oreal heiress. So somebody before her, some men made money and that allowed her to become one of the most powerful women on earth. And she has expanded that business that was handed to her. One who we all know, recently departed Queen Elizabeth II. She sat on the throne for 70 or 80 or 90 or 100 years. And um, we saw the, the Commonwealth change. We, or we saw the empire change and become the Commonwealth and become some other things during her time. That was not democratic. That was pure inheritance. So women get to positions of power and influence. And sometimes influence <clears throat> is as important as power through inheritance. So we've seen a couple of women do that through inheritance. And we think about people like Oprah Winfrey, once called the most beloved woman on earth, because she unearthed stories. She embraced people. She, she entered spaces that no black woman, no woman had entered and created a whole generation of media practitioners who were able to bring out stories, because we learn so much from stories. And so I want to say that um, I just want to mention one other woman at this time, and that's Mary C. Cole. She's a Jamaican woman. She wasn't a trained nurse, but she was someone who nursed people. She went to the Crimea during the war and created care and protection in Sebastopol and all sorts of very cold and remote places when the British would not allow her to go as a nurse as part of their contingent. It was just last year or the year before that a statue was raised in her honor in the United Kingdom. The first black woman statue in that country that has had black people as part of its story since 1494 or before that. So again, a woman of service. And nobody gave her permission to be there. But she went because she saw a need. And while she was there, she did things that were outstanding that ultimately, <coughs> over time, had to be recognized. So how do we know? Many of us get into positions because we're in the D suite or the C suite or the B suite, where we don't need to be elected. It's not democratic. We're appointed, we're invited, and so on. We become the head of Kettering Foundation through a very rigorous process, but you didn't have to be elected in the normal way. You become head of a university because there's a search process and your quality is formed. You become Custos of St. Andrew because the Governor General appoints you to that, or political ombudsman, because you're appointed. But then you also become perhaps a Speaker of the House of Representatives as an elected official. All of us have the same responsibility to make that space accessible to more women 
and to more persons. I'm going to throw in something that might embarrass some people. Now, you know, in a globe where we have um, only 13 of 193 countries headed by women, this is what the UN reports, and just under 50% of the world population being women. I, I don't have the numbers, but I know we own less than 30% of the land on earth, women. And there's a problem that young girls face all over the world and in these countries. There's something called period poverty. And for girls and women, biological issues can have a significant impact on our inclusion and our ability to do certain things. And around the world, there are girls who at that time of the month have to be in seclusion because they don't have the resources to protect themselves and to function in society as women and as men. And I, I think men have an even bigger role to play than we do. You know, you know what we're worth. You do. Don't feel threatened. Feel supported. Welcome us. I think that should have been two minutes, but you know, I'm annoying. <laughs> Actually, I do have a follow-up question on trade. Yes, before I go on to Una. So, it, it seems to me that, that we have many examples of women rising, but we are also saying they're not enough. They're not enough. There are many more places where women should have been, could have been, um, perhaps for the better. I mean, you know. Uh, and so, just really throw in, at this stage, because I would like to go to the, our extended family, what, what, what are the impediments that you highlighted here? Just two or three impediments just to keep us afloat. Yeah. Well, the first impediment is that we never did it before. Mm. So it's new. For a lot of people, it's new, threatening, and shocking. Uh, for some women, there is nobody willing to take the risk and to do the mentoring. And thirdly, we may not have assessed our own worth or developed our own worth in a way that prepares us to enter these spaces. So uh, whether it's because we're young, whether it's because we're First Nations, whether it's because we're black, whether it's because we're white, whether it's because we're undereducated, in our opinion, we are always as women looking at deficits. I'm sure you've heard the joke that women will arrive when we are like the man with a big belly, bald head, t-shirt hanging out, walking down the road thinking he's the hottest thing since life. <laughs> we're not there. We're not there. What are you mean? If we got there, if we got there, then, you know, the world would truly be our oyster. <laughs> the fact is, we do have some, some strengths that we need to package on our own behalf. We need to know, you know, yes, I have the education, yes, I have the experience, yes, I have the courage, and yes, I'm willing to fail and try again. And I'm willing to talk about myself. I'm willing to say, um, I've, I've done this thing, I've done this other thing, and I'm willing to do this other thing. We cannot be shrinking violence mm -hmm. all the time. I mean, every now and again, we can throw that out so many right. be better. But, you know, we really have to be bold here. Well, dear extended family, as you think about the man with the hanging t shirt, <laughs> Could I ask you to start thinking about some of these impediments, especially issues around our work, you know, that we don't value our own work and the lack of mentoring and so on. I want you to hold that thought at your table. But I want to come to you, Una, because um, when we say, we, because we never did this before, sometimes we struggle with that, right? Because we think about um, the village and we think about uh, our mothers and grandmothers and the ways in which they make decisions, the ways in which they drove the community. Um, in the uh, then um, the Ashanti kingdom in Ghana at the moment, powerful kingdom, um, that um, Yasans were a woman, led them as a warrior to fight the British. One thing that is said in the Ashanti kingdom when they're making decisions is, let's go and ask the old lady. Whenever there's a stalemate, there is a, you know, a little bit of a, a an altercation or we can move forward in a negotiation, we go and ask the old lady. It's figurative as it is really that there is somebody there that you go and ask. So these are things that were being practiced there. Do you would think that we have these in our communities already? And that's been your experience. You, you encounter some of these women. 
share a little bit about that and then tell us why they're not coming forward to all the levels that um, Donna talked about. Uh, I'll talk about the history of uh, Fiji to start off with. Eh? We had uh, white people who came in and ruled. It was uh, during those times that they brought the Indo-Fijian uh, community to come and work on sugarcane fields. So at that time, the Itauke community, indigenous Fijians, were living in their villages, and the Indo-Fijian were thriving because they were earning money. They were in the other. They were in their own settlements. Eh? So when uh, when we had our independence, we tried to bridge that gap. It's okay with the Indo-Fijians, but till now, Indo-Fijians are still the main income earners in Fiji because they had worked at that time. They had earned money while the Itauke were busy with their communal living. We were living by ourselves. We had our own traditional leaders. So that has caused a gap in the work that we do and also in Fiji right up until now. And the military coups didn't help that either. So when, when the Itauke people see that uh, the Indo-Fijians were up there while them, us as landowners, we are down here, that causes a lot of animosity, you know, like we get angry. So when something like a military coup comes up, that's the time that we show our anger. So we go for the Indo-Fijian community. So from that time, when we had our last coup, till now, our work as NGOs, we, we have been trying to bridge that gap. And our traditional women are still in our communities, even though we work as me, Vini, and them, when we come into the cities to work, we still go back to our communities. So for us, if I may ask, uh, answer Ruby's question, we have our traditional Itauke women who are there as, who have the wisdom, who have been, uh, they have been uh, taking us along all this time. So for me, as a traditional Itauke woman, while I'm, even though I'm working, I still go back to them. You know, I still ask uh, for advice from them. What do you think I should do? That, what, that involves my traditional, uh, that is, uh, it goes with my traditional role as well. Eh? So for us, Fiji, this is particularly for, uh, for us in Fiji because women have significant cultural roles and they have other roles in the contemporary society complex, sometimes the different roles may not be the same. The role that women play in Fiji is very important to the stability of our families, our community, and our nation as a whole. Uh, we have learned from our work at the Pacific Center for Peace Building that there is a great need to make fuller use of the genuine of the potential women that we have in our communities our women's group, and we network with the different modes of operation that we do. So I will tell you an example with the work that we do. Even though, as I have said before, even though Fijians live next to Indians, we still don't get on well. Mm. We don't know the issues that they face while we here, we have our own issues. So what my organization has uh, tried to do is bring them all together into an inter-ethnic dialogue where we talk about the issues and we realize that, yes, they are also facing this, but how they are going through it? They're going through it with their own way, while us, Itauke, are also trying to solve our issues with our own ways. So for me, uh, inclusive democracy, it requires gender equity and equality, which means providing a safe and enabling environment for women, all their diversity, to participate meaningfully in all the spaces that they engage in. We have also learned during the course of our work that women can create safe spaces to hold sensitive and difficult dialogues in Kalanoa. And in Fiji's history, this relates to ethnicity. For us, we live in a patriarchal society. In our communities, we listen to the men. But as I had explained on the first day, that we have our traditional roles as well. And being a woman, if you are a woman who is empowered, if you are earning money in Fiji, you also have a say at the table, at that table, but not at the chiefly table, at the development table. 
So for our government, it looks after developments in the community. I can have a say in that development tra table, but I can't have a say in the traditional table because it, it's a, a, about our blood. It comes in lineage, you know, like if my traditional role, I can speak up there, but I, can, I can't speak to the So that's, that's sort of a barrier for us women in Fiji, our patriarchal society. Men still look at us as, you know, like, you gotta work in the kitchen, you have to do this, you have to do that. And even when we have, we also have uh, women who are suffering from domestic violence in communities, and they don't have a voice. They can't go to the police to go and report because of fear of being victimized. And also the, the male cops won't take them seriously. You know, I want to pull out some of what you said because again, you you, you've talked about the fantastic role that women play in Fiji, but you've also, in that same process, highlighted some of the challenges. And you mentioned something that is being structural, you know, the colonial structure, for instance, and the remnants of that, which Fiji is still dealing with. Um, and you've talked about the ethnic tension which that came with. So, for, for, you know, I think what you've explained is, is that um, Fiji uh, is living in this um, sort of dual situation which was never resolved in, in, a, in, in an independent um, Fiji. You've also highlighted patriarchy, and then um, um, and the way that you all have to take your roles in respect of that. And the reason I pull this out and gave throw it to the tables to hold that thought is sometimes when we come to the room and we talk about inclusive democracies, people are struggling with all of these things in their backyard, and they're hearing us say these fantastic things about what inclusion should look like. Then we go back home and reality hits us. And we're thinking, can we apply these things? And yes, we can. But we would love a space in which we can bring this tension in so colleagues help us to work it out. And that's what your role is going to be um, today. Because this is held in Fiji on a daily basis. Um, and we do get emotional when we talk about it. So if I haven't said that about my home, my parlor, the women on the porch, we do cry, and it's fine. So I hope you're okay with that. Thank you for that. I'm gonna go to Jenny. You, you tend to spread, you know, stretch this for us because you also look at some of the legislations around this, the uh, regulatory frameworks around this, but you also experience some of these elements of gender and women's inclusion on a day-to-day -day basis. What does this look like in Mexico? Um, well, uh, thank you for having me today. Um, well, in Mexico, it's, it's one of those countries where women are more than 50% of the population. We make 52% of, of the population of the country. And um, right now, for the first time in history, two women are, gonna, are running for president, for the presidency of a country that has historically sunk to machos. <laughs> So it is expected that, that Claudia Sheinbaum, who's, govern, who's been governing Mexico City for the past years, will be the next president, um, very much with, with the president's blessing. And um, I have to acknowledge, we have to acknowledge that much of this recent progress uh, has only been, been possible because Morena is in government, the, the, the current party sort of left. And we are, we're all, all all Mexican parties meet at the center. It's not, not, not so much of a true left. Uh, and even if the president is far from being a feminist he, and, and has positioned himself as like anti-abortion since the campaign, and uh, interruption of pregnancy is now fully decriminalized in Mexico. Also since 2018, parity is mandatory in Congress and it has become a a policy, a practice across the three branches of government. Uh, for the first time, it is possible for candidates to be openly LGBT and become elected. And we have two trans women sitting in Congress. So, so there's 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 um there's there's a lot of a lot of progress going on. But then also, Mexico is a very dangerous country for women. So, between ten and eleven women are killed every day in the country and, and the risks and the violence have like 
distinct features when they target women, you know, like in a country with, with a, where disappearance is, is a big problem. Uh, men who disappear are between 18 and 35 years old. But for women, this, this age range is of highest risk is between 10 and 18 years old. So these are girls. Um, and like, well, male journalists, for example, receive, because that, that's another, another uh, feature of Mexico, is like one of the most dangerous countries for journalists and for, and for um, defenders of human rights. And so while male journalists may receive personal physical threats for their work, women journalists receive threats that target their children or their parents when they're under their care, uh, or threats that involve sexual connotations. You know, there's women journalists in the, in, the, in the protection mechanism that give testimonies of like finding their underwear drawer being emptied on their bed or on, on, the, on their tables or like finding hairs and traces of like some men taking a shower in their bath while they were not home. So, so that's, that's, uh, that's kind of the, the, the place we're at. Like, like, uh, like Una mentioned, we have made great progress in, in, the, in the recent years, but like still we are, we are struggling with all, all these issues. Before I come to ET, tell us a little bit of how do women navigate the space in which every day you could be among the 10 to 12. How, 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 do, you, how do you just navigate that like on a practical basis? And especially women journalists. <coughs> um, well, there's the, like at the Henry Fowler Foundation where I work, we, we cooperate with this uh, amazing information agency called CIMAC, which is a, a, a an information agency that works with a gender perspective, and they, they keep track of like all aggressions to female journalists. Um, uh, there's just like, I guess, massive networks of, of support mm -hmm. between women, between journalists, um, their solidarity. There's a series of strategies that have, have been developed, you know, uh, like uh, there's always, uh, like you give your location to other colleagues, there's always somebody monitoring you. Mm -hmm. If you are going into a dangerous mm -hmm. place, you check in regularly. There's there's a number of strategies and, and, and they have been, <coughs> they are being um, systematized and shared by the journalists themselves. And so it's it's very interesting how, how there's in, in this sense and in this level, there is not a competition, but there's a strong, very strong solidarity among the among the journalists and, and among the, the human rights workers as well. And I bet that our colleagues from um, Venezuela, um, Colombia, Nicaragua, Guatemala can actually relate to this. This is day-to-day -day survival. Iti, we're here in Aldova. Our guests have come. They have shared these stories. What are you hearing? And how does this resonate? Um. I think in our country, in even the Kettering Foundation talks about inclusive um, democracy. We will not get there unless we deal with the toxic issue of racism. It's rampant, and I'm sure it is in your spaces too. The first ships that came to New Zealand, they brought white supremacist ideologies that still remain today. It seeps through every sector. Uh, and the ones that, well, victims mostly are Maori women. So the hierarchy uh, in our country is white men, white women, Maori women, Maori women. So our incarceration rate for Maori women is 56% of those in prison are Māori women. We're only 14% of the population. So there's a huge mismatch there. Uh, dealing with racism on a day-to-day -day basis, women go for those top jobs. They're confident in going for those top jobs, but there's usually 
a white man that gets it over a woman. Men can be operating at 40% and ineffective. A woman operating at 190% and very effective question themselves if they go for that job and the men at 40% think they can do it. Um, so the work that we do is taking that, because you've heard about our Te Tiriti Awakening, our treaty, and what our tūpuna had envisaged, our ancestors had envisaged, was a socially just society. They foresaw that and they uh, were future-proofing us, really. Unfortunately, it hasn't um, turned out that way because of colonisation and the uh, stolen land. We had <coughs> our own economy, we were thriving, we moved around globally, pre-European. Uh, so, I can't remember what I was going to do. <laughs> um, where, where I want to go with that is that similar question what I asked them um, Jenny. I mean, how are, you, are women surviving day to day? How are they doing this? What is it that we can learn from here? And what are the hurdles they have to overcome? Because as I said at the beginning, the story of Miss Mary is powerful. And she experienced what you described. And there are more happening. But we've got to know how to navigate this, don't we? <coughs> we, have some, we have some really strong women. We don't operate individually. Right. We operate collectively. We do things together. We can talk about things, uh, strategize. We're very good at strategizing so that we have those positions of influence. So despite all the hurdles, that a lot of those hurdles are underpinned by racism. Mm. So despite all those hurdles, we do well um, considering those in the way. We're leading the revitalisation of our language. We have some strong Māori politicians who who get the worst um, responses from the community. They just hassle so much when you compare it to the white men, politicians, or the white women. So there's a lot of things we are leading in the country to take back. Um, and we're, we're not shrinking violets, so we are. We do get out there. Yeah, and it's still not easy. It's so that's what we want to acknowledge. Yeah. There's still a lot of trauma to deal with because the structural issues still exist. We talk about racism, these, all of these still exist. Yes. I want to ask my guest, do you have any questions or anything that, uh, around anything anybody has said <coughs> you want to prove further? I want maybe Jenny to talk a little bit more about, you know, the issues in Mexico. For most of the world, you know, the story of Mexico is a great tourism destination or a place with crime or in which immigrants go to the US. I think I've been as unfair as the world has been to Mexico in that characterization. But every day, it's a huge country People are living in rural areas and in, in towns. And um, I, I don't think we get a, a, a real flavor of who Mexicans are <coughs> and what's important to people in Mexico, women and girls growing up in Mexico. Hmm. Well, Mexico is a, it's all that that you already <laughs> mentioned, to be honest. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a wide and diverse country. It's mm. or like oh, I, I don't have that figure, but it, we're somewhere near a hundred million people. So yeah. um, there's um, I don't know uh, sixty something uh, indigenous languages being spoken. There's um, and many that have have been lost, <coughs> hundreds probably that have been lost in, in the recent history. So it's a it's a very diverse country uh, with high contra and, and with high inequality. So so that that is is an issue. Um, uh, even if like like having uh, 
having parity and having women in power, of course, doesn't, doesn't necessarily guarantee a feminist agenda to be pushed forward. So, so there's also a lot of room for the sequestering of the, of the feminist di discourse of, of making it <coughs> instrumentalized by, by uh, anti-rights movements. Uh, but um, I don't know, there's also a, 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 a very, very important, and I was talking yesterday colleague from South Africa about this, how after, after um, COVID there, there was this uh, revival of many traditional notions and, and, and knowledges because uh, the supply chains were all affected, you know, people turned back to just <coughs> growing their own food, finding, finding uh, local sources, uh, exchanging stuff and, and women women were uh, very much at, at the core of this just like like reclaiming the, this this traditional knowledge and and and, uh, and leading the way for for the new ways of, of exchange and for the revolution giving value back to to these these forms of of exchange so that that has been something something that we could see as a positive outcome of, of like yeah. what was the pandemic in the recent years. And, um, and well, uh, women are also at the front of the, of the, of the defense of the land. Uh, women, and at the policy level, uh, women are leading also <coughs> climate policy and the, and, and the environmental movements in Mexico. I have to say we also have a, a, a very regressive and fossilized <laughs> female secretary of energy, but <laughs> but yeah, the defense of the land is largely led led by women, and this goes beyond far beyond the essentialist association of like women and the mother earth and the Pachamama. It's, it has more to do with like women actually being at the front line of the environmental impacts of like water shortages. <coughs> of the loss of productivity of the land, of the farmland. And it has to do with intersectionality, of course, because it is rural women who, who would face the greatest challenges, like uh, being poor, being uneducated, often indigenous, dispossessed. So, 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 so political advancements in Mexico are starting at, the, at, the, at these local levels, at the assembly level, at the community at women being entitled to own the land, to make decisions, being part of the directive of the communal assemblies, and, and from there up. I do like what is emerging because I'm hearing this, this, this reclamation, reclaiming what is ours, you know, and what should be, and, and find an energy to, to, to push the envelope and, 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 and the, 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 the structures. And it's still not easy, and I keep I always keep saying that it's not easy because the fact that we're looking for <coughs> the success stories, it doesn't mean we're oblivious to the problems. I want to turn to the extended family, and I'm African to the core, right? The extended family. <laughs>